the mysterious blue glow around the core of a nuclear reactor deep submerged in water is a type of electromagnetic waves called Cherenkov radiation. They are emitted by electrons passing through water in a speed that is even faster than the speed of light in water. The emission of Cherenkov radiation is almost instant. However, some other materials can absorb energy from radiation and then emit it in a period of time as scintillation light, which is another type of electromagnetic radiation. Cherenkov radiation and scintillation light are all called optical photons in the Geon 4 simulation. Even though optical photons and the gamma rays are all electromagnetic radiation, they are treated completely differently in the Geon 4 simulation. This is because an optical photon normally has an energy of only a few eV, the propagation of which through matters a base optical formula such as Schnell's law, while a gamma ray normally has energy from a few tens of keV to meV, and the gamma ray interact with matter more like a particle instead of light. If you use one of the official Geon 4 physics lists, the physics processes related to the creation of Cherenkov and scintillation light are not enabled by default. You will have to use the physics list factory add optical command to enable it explicitly before run initialize. You can then use the process list electromagnetic command to confirm that the two processes are created. In addition to the processes, that involves the creation of optical photons, there are also physics processes dealing with the absorption and the scattering of optical photons in one material, and boundary processes that deal with the optical photon propagation in between materials, as well as materials that can shift the wavelength of optical photons. Once you use this command to activate all the optical processes, you can then use the following command to toggle individual ones on and off. For more built-in commands related to optical processes, you can refer to the Geon4 menu. It looks like there are many physics processes related to the optical photons. It is useful to classify them into two different categories. The first one is the production of optical photons. The others are all transportation of optical photons. There are two ways to create optical photons, Cherenkov radiation, scintillation light. There are also two types of transportations of optical photons. One is the transportation inside one type of material. The other is the transportation of the optical photons on the boundary of two materials. Let's go through the common ones step by step. The emission angle of the Cherenkov radiation can be calculated if n, the refractive index of the medium from where the Cherenkov radiation is emitted, is known to the Geon 4 physics process. If nothing is specified, even if the Cherenkov radiation physics process is enabled in Geon 4, no Cherenkov light can be generated. Since the refractive index is a property of a material, and the material is specified in the Geon4 detector geometry description file. We need to define it when we define the detector geometry. Of course, one can hard code the optical properties of a material in C++, but that's not what we would like to do. We'd like to use GDML or text geometry description to avoid changing and recompiling the source code. It is possible for you to specify some optical properties in GDML, but with some limitation. For example, properties cannot be assigned to existing NIST materials predefining Geon4. If you would like to specify the optical properties of a material, you will have to define it first in GDML even if the material is already predefined in Geon4. The situation is worse in the default Geon4 text geometry description. There is no way for you to define the optical properties there. 
That's why two new tags are added in Gears to enable the definition of optical materials and surfaces using the text geometry description syntax. One is called prop, the other one is called serve. More than 40% of the C++ coding in Gears.cc is used to implement this new feature. Hopefully, it will be absorbed in the future Gen4 releases. This way, Gears.cc can become even smaller. Note that the new text should be placed at the end of a TG file after all the text that is known by Gen4 to avoid interrupting the process of these known text by Gen4 before Gears start to process the added ones. The specification of the refractive index to a material is not a straightforward task because the refractive index is not a simple number. Instead, it changes with the wavelength of the optical photons. The silicon dioxide.tg file is used to define the R index property of silicon dioxide predefined in the G4 NIST material list. 100 photon energy points are picked up along the x-axis from 0.2 eV till 5.942 eV. The R-index values corresponding to each energy point are read from the curve and listed in the last line of this file. In the pmtwindow.tg file, the material G4 silicon dioxide is assigned to a PMT window that is 2 mm thick and 3 inches in diameter. The last line of this TG file is used to include silicon dioxide or TG file where the optical properties are defined. The PMT window.tg file is used in a macro file called Cherenkov in PMT window.mac where 500 keV electrons are shot normal to the PMT window. Five events are simulated. The result is saved in HEPREP files. This is one of the event display showed in a HEPREP file browser. The PMT boundaries are marked with two horizontal orange lines. The red lines here is the instant electron track. The green lines are Cherenkov photons emitted along the electron when it gets into the quartz window. When the electron track bends downward, the Cherenkov cone is also emitted downward. Let's go through a few other event displays where you can see clearly that the direction of the Cherenkov cone follows that of the instant electron track. To generate Cherenkov light, only one property of the material has to be specified, that is the refractive index. Well, to generate scintillation light, you have to specify at least two parameters. One is called the scintillation yield, which is the number of photons emitted by the scintillation material per unit energy absorbed. The second one is called the resolution scale, which is the variation of the number of generated photons. In the example csi.tg file, the scintillation yield of 100 photons per keV and a resolution scale of 2 are assigned to the material cesium iodide predefined in the GM4 NIST material database. This file is included as the last line of another TG file called CSI in vacuum.tg where the same material is assigned to a sensitive CSI crystal that is 3 inches in diameter and 5 centimeters long. It is placed in a vacuum and used in a file called scintillation in csi.mac, where 6 keV gamma rays are emitted isotropically in the center of the crystal. Five events are generated and the results are saved in HEPREP files. This is one of the event display where the cylindric cesium iodide crystal is shown in purple. The emitted scintillation photons from the center of the crystal are shown as green lines. The transportation of optical photons inside 
one type of material is controlled by some other properties of the material for example absorption length they can all be set using the same tab prop well the transportation of optical photons on the boundary of two materials relies on the properties of both materials as well as the property of the boundary itself a unified model is used in GM4 for the simulation of optical surfaces. If the interface between two dielectric materials is perfectly polished, the transportation of photons through it, a base Schnell's law, which only involves the refractive indices of both materials. In this special case, there is no need to specify any property of the surface itself. Instead, we just need to set up the refractive indices for both materials. For example, if you would like to understand how optical photons emitted inside a cesium iodide crystal gets into the quartz window of two PMTs attached to the end surfaces of the crystal, all you need to do is to define the crystal volume and the PMT window and then specify the R index of silicon dioxide and the cesium iodide at the end of the TG file. Some of the photons get into the quartz window with a slight change of their directions. Others get reflected back to the crystal. Now let's consider the optical interface between a cesium iodide crystal and a Teflon reflector. The reflectivity of a Teflon reflector can be as high as 99%. However, the directions of the reflected photons do not obey Schnell's law. Instead, they are more or less randomized, which can be described by the Lambert cosine law. This property belongs to the surface instead of the materials. That's why we will have to define a surface called cesium 2 Teflon in between the cesium and Teflon volumes. We need to choose a surface finish called ground front painted in the unified GM4 optical model to use the Lambert cosine law. I want to emphasize one more time, such setup is in addition to the specification of the optical properties of the materials themselves.